Accenture. And we're trying a few technology things today. So we've got, we're trying questions and we're, we're piping this out to our service area and it, as well as it will be uh, archived so you can see it uh, and go back and look and say, oh, what did they say and all this kind of stuff. I enjoy that, that ability, but welcome all. And uh, we're going to start off this morning with uh, our uh, president. And so we welcome her here to uh, Indianapolis service area. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Frank. And we'll try this with technology. I don't like the fact that it's going to be archived because all those things that I go, oh, it'll be on there. All right. But and welcome to all those across the service area that are that are joining us from other locations. We appreciate those that are here as well as uh, those that are out. So if we could, um, do I have the remote. We have a pretty long agenda. We have two hours, uh, but. We know we have gone as long as three hours. We're going to work really hard. To, you have people on the call. We're going to try to be uh, two hours or less. But there's a, a lot here. And then the purpose of this is really an update with all of you for your questions for us. So don't uh, think that this is a one way. Anything, you stop me anytime. If our questions streaming in, is somebody getting those questions as well? Okay. So just wave your hand and, and we'll take those as well. But you'll see I have a fairly long list, and then uh, Steve as well has some items. I do want to begin by saying that many of you know this will be the last President Provost tour with the two of us. You know that on June 30th, uh, Steve will be retiring. We're going to miss him terribly. He's done just such an amazing job. When I asked him to stay a little longer to help us get through the strategic plan and where we are today, he graciously agreed, and I hope you'll join me in thanking Provost Steve Tincher for his great service to Ivy Tech. I catch myself inviting him to things next fall, and he'll just very kindly say, you know, I won't be here. But the um, just the other update on that is we do have the search underway. Uh, we will begin interviews uh, at the end of this month as we get to finalists, both the CAOC and the faculty council will have an opportunity to be engaged with that final selection of the next provost. It is our most important position in this institution, uh, and, and it certainly honors all of you as faculty, so it's important that we find it'll be difficult to fill his shoes exactly, but we have great candidates, and uh, we will have a lot of engagement in that process. So let me just begin with um, the strategic plan. You know it's launched. It's our communities, your college, uh, Pathways for Student Success in a Stronger Indiana. We have shared this now. It's rolled out as of January. It's been shared with quite a number of organizations, including the General Assembly. We had them at courses a little over a month ago, uh, including President Pro Tem. David Long was there. We had a number of our students present as well as we went through the strategic plan. Much very good feedback. Uh, the Higher Ed Commission heard our strategic plan and uh, affirmed it the week after the State Board did in December. Uh, DWD we met with in late January with their new commissioner, Fred Payne, also very supportive. And then the governor's office had a chance to sit down with he and his chief of staff, just MJ, Mary Jane Michaelak, our government relations VP and I, um, probably six weeks ago, end of January, and just went through it from beginning to end. And he was writing like crazy, lots of great questions, very supportive. And I was just in the governor's office with some of his team yesterday. They are so appreciative of the work we are doing across the system. And it is to um, that second last point about our alignment to workforce needs. When we say that, we mean not just those two-year and sub-baccalaureate credentials that we give, but as well at the four-year and beyond that transfer that our students purposefully know that if they're pursuing something, there will be a job at the other end and that we really have a way of helping to help them think through through our quadrants we'll talk about here a little more. But in any case, it's been very well received across uh, all those areas. We've been rolling it out. And it certainly revolves around this vision of 50,000 high quality degrees credentials per year to match with, if you remember, the two things we matched with was the Lumina goal 
which is at 60% by 2025, 60% of our workforce having a post-secondary degree or credential uh, in the state of Indiana. We're at 41, almost 42% now. That's still a big lift. It's more than a million degrees or credentials. So our piece, half a million uh, in that sub-baccalaureate space. But also if you listen to the governor's state of the state, he talked about a million new jobs between now and 2025. 700,000 being retirements, 300,000 new jobs are what we project. And again, over half of those being in the potent requiring post-secondary. So in each case, this number is really a real number. It's what Indiana needs us to do. Just as a reminder, anyone want to tell me, do you know what where we are today? I use this number a lot, but I don't know if you remember it. Do you know how many degrees or credentials and credentials we awarded last year? Okay, here's the number, 21,182. I did, you didn't have to know the, all the numbers, but that's a big lift. That's going to be more than doubling. Now, some of those will be shorter term credentials, which CHE is very supportive of if they get that our student a good job, right? It's what the what industry needs, but it also includes industry certifications, which we've never measured before. We have our testing centers that have some of this information, but we don't have a pipeline to what are those high quality credentials that certifications, industry certifications, and which ones will count. Um, like nursing, for instance, where they pass their nursing test right after graduating. Well, we're not going to count twice on that. They, we really care that they pass their NCLEX exam and that they're out there as a nurse, but we're not going to double dip and say, oh, we get two for that. We're going to look at that credential, one a year gets uh, them in, and then next year they get another one, and then next year, yes, we will count them that way, but we really want them to reflect that we've given the student the opportunity to have a better job. That credential has gotten them. So we're still working through how the count on the industry certifications, that's being worked through workforce alignment, but uh, I know that we're well on the way and I'm going to share a few more things uh, that we're doing as we go through this piece of the, the uh, presentation this morning. The mission statement, I start by saying I would have never as a consultant let anybody create a mission statement this long. That is just terrible form. It should be one statement, two at the most. Um, however, we're academics, we get paid for our words, we go, we, we look a little longer than some of the others. But with that, this remember came out of 120 sessions of your input of what should our mission be. And so um, it is long, but it really says who we are and, it, and it, it reflects the complexity of what we are and how we contribute. We are Indiana's community college. That's still a new thing out there. So making sure we own it and we help um, get that word out into our communities. We serve the people of our state through accessible and affordable world-class education and adaptive learning. That's a mouthful, but it's all true. That accessibility, you know we have the greatest range of students that come to us and how important it is that we are accessible and affordable for those that we serve. But the world class is equally important and I see it every day as I'm around our state and I hear it from our students and the employers and our communities, the quality of what you do, the quality that we offer here in our smaller class environment with highly qualified faculty and staff is amazing work. So that world class is something we own and we're going to continue to own and we're always going to strive for the best and that we are we have this adaptiveness about us in how we meet the students where they are and so I thank you for how you lean into that every day we empower them for both career and transfer aspirations both of them are really about career but career and transfer we know we're about 60 percent workforce 40 percent will transfer and we are completely committed to both uh, but they both eventually lead to workforce. So it is important that we're good on both both accounts. And then finally, we are we understand that what we do really does drive the economies of the communities we're in. 
And it is about education, but it's also about the earnings attainment of our students and how that impacts our communities and strengthens them as they move for, forward. I can tell you, it's in our smaller communities, we are higher education and we are to them the future of their community. So um, we own all of that. All right, so there's seven goals. We're not gonna go through all of them, but these are our seven goals. Great things happening on all. I'm just going to pick two to speak to with you today because this is really one faculty advisors. These, this is the one we really own and it's student success and it will always be our number one at Ivy Tech. Um, there are six strategies. So here's another place as a strategic planning consultant. I would have never let you have more than four strategies. But this is our big goal. Uh, student success is everything about what we do here. So having six, on, this is the only goal that has six strategies, but they're all important. And the first one you know, it's about meeting our students where they are and helping them have what they need. So that in the areas like wraparound services, that's just critical that we meet them where they are. Student Government Association has asked us to look at that two years ago and we continue to look for those strategies and tactics that help us do that. Supporting students to succeed in gateway courses in the first attempt. Who are my English and math faculty in the room? Anybody here? Yay, which? English, English thank you. Do I have any math faculty? Okay, well thank you. English 111, we're on the third reInvent. Keep doing what you're doing because we're gonna get them over 50% yet. But it is not to bring, it's not to lower our rigor, it is to figure out how do we best meet these students and help them. Some are way behind when they come in and how do we help them uh, gain those uh, competencies they need to be successful. Um, math, certainly we've done so much there with Math Pathways, Corex, but I'm gonna just share one thing that we're looking at as a new concept. Some of you have great relationships with IUPUI. Some of you may know Kevin Burkopes. Anybody know him? He actually runs the MAC at IUPUI. He's a uh, PhD math, uh, and he has developed this, it's tutoring at a whole different level. It's tutoring by student to student. It uses um, every table's a whiteboard, so you're writing on the tables, and it has technology built in that helps students be able to interact working with that technology very easily, including remotely. Um, he actually was one of our adjunct faculty in Lafayette as he was doing his doctorate. Uh, and he really would like, he believes we're the perfect place. Now he's also done at Crispus, did you say it was Crispus Attics, also has one. So this is not limited to four year things, but here's what they've seen at IUPUI. In the math space, those who use it, more than one grade higher than those that don't. Um, it is very complimentary, and again, it is student run. So we are looking at the campuses I've shared there, Bloomington, Lafayette, Muncie, Kokomo's still figuring out what their project, if they're in or not, but we, we're gonna pilot it. We kind of picked some of the other campuses first. Indy's such a big place, even if we were to decide where would you do this, it would be tough. So we wanna see it work for us. Um, we're fundraising for it right now. Um, they cost about uh, 250000 per center, uh, assuming you have the space already. So uh, we, we believe this is one more thing that will really lift us in that, helping students get over that fear of math, peer-to-peer, -peer, one of the interesting things. So students who teach, and he, he assures us we will have an abundance. He said, do not even worry. The high school's not had any prob problems. You're gonna have plenty of students who wanna do this. Many of them after this experience decide to go into teaching. They love the experience and the students that they mentor love it. So anyway, that's just one project that we wanted to show that deals with uh, strategy 1.2. Uh, expanding capacity for high demand selective admission programs. Frank, you just shared this morning as we talked about nursing being the, the one that's most obvious there. Do I have any nursing faculty in the room? They're probably out at Lawrence, so they, but I'll, I'll just wave to them. Uh, they're assuming that they're out at Lawrence and other places. 
that is the one where we have so many students who qualified, well qualified students who want to get in. We fill every seat across the state and there's still an excess of 50% more demand out there. Uh, so as Frank, as you were talking this morning, you're, you're working on how do we expand nursing and are there some innovative ways to create uh, new pathways uh, for others in medical professions. We, we have a, a little bit of verbiage in legislation uh, at the State House now that would allow us to use, you know, part of the concern is there's not enough MSNs to be able to expand as well as clinical spots. Uh, the ability to have the option to use BSNs in clinicals to support those, um, asking the State Board of Nursing to consider that. So we're looking at how do we help more come in. There's just so many good careers and why it's here is that if you've waited in line and you can't get in, at some point you give up. And uh, this, is the, there, this is a dream of so many good, qualified students and they can't get in. And we are so affordable and we have such high quality programs that the, the hospitals uh, and clinics need us to do this. So we're, we're looking at that. 1.4 is Educational Pathways for Continuous Enrollment. Thank you for all your efforts in structured schedules and, and giving that predictable, that student knowing going forward. You probably also know that we have uh, asked campuses to think about more eight-week classes. So I want to open it up to your questions about it. We usually have this later, but it, this is really the right time because it's all about helping that student stay on their pathway and complete uh, as soon as they can. It, did a number of you read Ron Sloan's white paper on eight-week classes? What we, you know, we looked at the data. Our internal data shows that our students in eight-week classes do better. We also studied, he studied those nationally. And again, other community colleges have seen the same uh, outcome. Odessa uh, was almost closed down as a community college in Texas. Eight-week classes has been one of their key student success strategies at which now they are considered a achieve the dream as or an Aspen a rising star and they're there they have made amazing advancements with eight-week classes um, so we're actually going to visit Odessa at the end of April they're putting on their first student success conference so we're taking a large team down uh, and I'm sure we'll have somebody here invited. We're, we're working out details. Steve's been doing the work on that. Um, we also have our own new chancellor from Grand Valley who uh, started up a new campus for Grand Valley. They were 90% eight-week classes. They came back. They pulled the pendulum back. We've talked predominantly eight-week. They've pull the pendulum to 80 percent. It's the right at the 80 percent because we say not every class will work that way. Not every program will work that way. Could be accreditation or other things, but they have they they have settled at that 80 percent and he's like, oh yeah, we can do this. So I want, that sounds easy, doesn't it? I will ask here, Frank, what percentage of your courses today are eight week? About. Well, for today, where are you about? 19% and where we've asked you to think about more for the fall. We're trying to go for 25 percent. We're, we're already at about 22%. Okay. Very good. So we might get to 25. Um, we have the goal is over the next five years to get predominantly to eight week. So we also have an implementation team of about 20 people working, representing all of our campuses, working on eight week classes. Uh, together because we know there are things like for instance and your ASAP folks will tell you this you really should have a fall break you should have a one-week break between the a week do I have any ASAP in here okay but that that's something for for those who teach you finish one you catch your air and the students as well catch your breath and then go back in so those are some of the there, there's any number of financial aid and other questions to answer <clears throat> when we get to the predominant uh, level. But what are your thoughts to those eight-week courses? Yes. Um, I'm curious because I think we have um, students that say that they just hear you on the, 
Oh gosh. Okay. <laughs> Um, I think that I, I think in reading the research about this, I think you know there could potentially be some good things there. Understanding that not all programs will work that way, like you said, um, but I think an important part of that is building a culture where eight-week courses are the norm, so students are working with advisors to balance a schedule, um, so that students aren't taking like an eight-week course with a whole bunch of other 16 women. does it, you know what I mean? So I'm just curious, is there, is part of this plan working with advising and what's happening there? Yeah, Heather, I would say absolutely you're right. I mean, this is a transition. Now, granted, it's not all brand new because we've already done 19% or in the past, but as we go more predominantly, that yes, and Jeff Fanter, our enrollment guy, for advisors, we hope to have instead of three times to enroll a year, you have five. Every those eight weeks, you have a chance for new people to come in, and it becomes a more continuous. Which again, for adults, that's they don't live semester to semester. Adults live their lives in these next series of weeks ahead of them, and so I think you're absolutely right. Advising, financial aid, there's uh, many things we need to to think about. So. No, we're on a journey there. We're not going to get there immediately, but we're working and, and we've asked. We have Columbus, uh, our Columbus campus is going to go 70% eight week classes in the fall. They've said the data's clear, we're going to do it. So we didn't ask everyone to do that. We have a couple of others that are over 50%, but we'll learn a lot ourselves. But in parallel, know that we have a very deliberate implementation team. Uh, that is thinking through these things and how do we prepare everyone to do even more next in the uh, fall of 2019 so uh, that we can do it as deliberately as we can. Other questions on eight-week classes? How many, uh, yeah, I'll, go ahead. I know that right now um, a lot of students who end up in eight-week classes are maybe not the best candidate for said eight week classes, um, but it's the only thing that's still open. Except the eight week. Yes, right. Um, or, you know, there happen to be some spots open in a first eight week because they aren't full because no one perhaps wants to, if they have a choice, if they register early, they've chosen to take the 16 week option. Um, so I think, you know, I would be interested to know about the, uh, the caliber of the student, you know, how to sort of vet out which students would be, would be good for that. Well, the data would suggest that it's better for all students, but it does require, as faculty, we have to rethink the class, right? It's not taught, you don't just double it up. You have to, we have to rethink that, which is all a part of it. Um, I just make the observation that uh, as an engineering student, the only time I got a 4.0 was in the summer when I did an eight week version. I took differential equations and advanced statistics. So they weren't easy classes. But it was easy. It seemed easy because I only had to focus on two things instead of five or six classes, right? So it is a to think about from a student's perspective, uh, and particularly adults. If I'm an adult part-time student, I can take one class and really focus. And in eight weeks, I then go to another class. And by the way, almost all MBA programs are done in a either five or eight week, five, six, eight week format. For adults, it is the way. And when we think about the busy whirlwind our students live in, working, I can hold my employer back a few weeks from transferring me to a different shift or having some other things. I, to, to hold them back 16 weeks is really, really hard. Um, so it's a lot of factors. But likewise, we have to have our students have books week one. They can't wait till week two or three. A quarter is the so we have a lot of things to work through to do if this is if as the data says this is best for students we have to think through a lot of things and you're exactly right about it okay anything else was there another hand on eight week yes I've seen a lot of conversation going around about adjusting our online courses for eight weeks. Do we have data from those example schools that we've been looking at on whether they have differences in the online and face-to-face -face classes? Differences in what? Wait, differences in outcomes and in, in what they're doing to prepare for them. 
we should put that on our list for Odessa. That's a really good question. We know we're 10% lower in the outcomes of, uh, of eight-week classes. But oh, by the way, Vincennes is too. President Johnson said they have the exact same. Now, that doesn't mean it's okay. It just means we both need to solve it. So there are efforts to work on uh, how we're approaching online classes and what can we do better with those. Kaplan now, Global Purdue Global, um, has some great ways of how they assess students and help prepare them for online learning. We've got a lot to do there, to, to but, but we also know not all students are well prepared for online, and could we have a way of helping them assess ahead whether this is even a good option for them? So lots of, lots of work. Steve, you want to add? Well, we, might, um, we might add, in, in addition to uh, professional development for faculty, also for students in regards to exactly what you're saying for students to understand what's, learn, what's their approach to learning, what's their learning strategies, how might they approach an eight-week class uh, contrasted to a traditional 16-week. Okay, I'm going to keep going through these quickly, but I did want to give you that. Um, intentionally engaging the college uh, with students around academic and career success. So I know I have a number of advisors in here. Where are you? Raise your hands. Thank you. Appreciate greatly what you do. Um, so a couple questions for you. One is, what this is a quiz. What percentage of your students, other than nursing, because you'd probably have them out there anyway, but really know what they want to do when they come to see you the first time? Just shout out a number. About like 20, 30, 40, where would you say? 20? Half or less? Okay, this has been cool because we started asking this in Valpo, and the first, that was 20% what they said. Madison, the second campus, they said, the advisor said 50%, and then those people around her said, oh no, not 50. So anyway, we're probably in that 20 to 50. So it says, how can you be, advise somebody if they don't yet know what they want to do? It makes a big difference. Now we can get them started, but the second piece that goes with that little factoid, as it's becoming almost analytical research now, as I've asked it on so many campuses, um, the second piece is that in the student's expected time frame metric. Remember we decided, and advisors, you've been doing a great job asking students, when do you expect to complete? What is your time frame? If we shouldn't tell you, you should tell us what is your expectation. So we've been doing that. Over 90% of our students, new students, have been recorded when they expect to complete. How, what percentage, one year in, do you think are on track? 20%. She's, she's actually optimistic. 17% of the students one year. Wow. So this strategy is so important. It says somehow our students, either they don't have realistic expectation, they may be changing their mind every day, they may not have an academic plan, they financially can't do it. Whatever the things we have a real, so we took a huge step back on this and said, wow, we've got some real thinking to how do we organize a process that helps a student. If they don't know week one, and I know many of them show up two weeks before classes start, so got that, but how do we get them to career development? How do we figure out all the things so that they can make up their mind within the next few weeks? and then begin setting that academic plan in place, and then look at the financial aid planning. Can that work as well? So that by the end of the semester, that student ought to know. So we have a lot to do in career development. We are working with Ascend Indiana, but we have a lot to think through and develop. How do we help that student figure out? I can't imagine being successful. So you know, as an engineer, you had to take a lot of physics, nothing against physics. I didn't like it, but not. I would have never stuck it out had I not known I really wanted to be an engineer. And I knew that because I co-opt. So I knew I really wanted to be an industrial engineer. Those are kind of things that our students, how do we help them have that clear career view? And our nurses do, and they succeed because they know that's what they want to be. And they're very committed, and they know they're going to have to get through anatomy and physiology. And they know, they know the work 
but they know out there's their big goal and they work towards it. So we this one's a very important one. We're working through and advisors, you know, we've gone to our new advising model, that's all good, but we have more to do, more to do to figure this one out. So um, we'll be working together at the Student Success Summit. Are some of you going to that? That'll be great. Um, but we think this is a strategy that we've, we're just like one level down. We've got a lot under that one to work on. And utilizing technology to create a seamless and intuitive student experience is the sixth one. It's recognizing that at Ivy Tech, we're going to need to use technology to help work with our students. We don't get, they don't live with us 24-7 like uh, a Purdue main campus or IU Bloomington, right? Um, we get them just a few hours of their week. So how can we do that better? So the student app is under development, and we had 10 teams present, student teams presented in a shark tank setting a few weeks ago with, we had uh, our own OIT, Lige Hensley, and Matt Etchison, the VP of Workforce for IT. We also had Teresa Lubbers, uh, Commissioner of Higher Education, and Terry Anker, our trustee, and one who's done a lot of the shark tank kind of stuff in the past. We had amazingly good ideas come out of those students. Um, things like, you'll appreciate it on this campus, well, probably across your whole service area, the number one thing they wanted was a map. Go figure, and inside the building, like at Best Buy, where you can see where every aisle is, because this place is a maze. Steve, you even couldn't help a student find a room. To, yeah, <laughs> this, you know that we, we are a really interesting mix of buildings here. I'm, I'm lost, I still get lost. So our students don't have an hour to go find the room. They get here five minutes before class. And think about, I, I know my first day of class when I'm down front and students are coming in and I'm not very helpful to them in, in helping them figure out where they go. So a map, that's an easy one. Um, a second thing they wanted was a degree audit, a degree plan where they could see where they are, they could pull up on their app exactly what classes they had and what they needed to complete and to know they were on track. I'll bet you all as, as advisors would love them to have that. I mean, because that you'd be on the same page with them. Wow. So, so that was, and a, a third one that was interesting was they called it a vote for a class. So chairs, if you have a class you're not sure whether you should offer or not, you're thinking about offering push it out on the app, your students can say, oh, I, I'd sign up or no. And how quickly, in like five seconds, 10 seconds of five minutes, you've got feedback on whether you can do that. So I say that because the students, their first, as the students present, they said, why don't we have one already? You know, like, duh. Um, and then they had so many good ideas. We're gonna hire three of them as interns this summer to help us in the development because who better to develop the app than the people who are going to uh, use it? Two of them will be tech students from our uh, software development, but one is a, she was a general studies student, very art oriented. She was, gonna, yeah, so, um, so anyway, we're, we have three of them so far, but expect that coming, but that's part of that creating that seamless and, and intuitive student experience uh, to be successful. So. Quickly then, um, our metrics, fall to spring retention, where, uh, where are you here on fall to spring? Frank or Kathy, where do you think you're? 68, okay, so next year, that's the year one, 70 goal. Uh, fall to fall, uh, we wanna get from 50 to 60 and we're? Okay, yeah, so, so you're right on the cusp, but we, you can see the lift. If we're going to help students succeed, these are the lifts. Now, would love that fall to fall to go beyond 60%. We're still in that one plus three mode. Our students transfer before they complete. However, uh, we can move that needle. And we have a lot of support. In fact, when we had the provost from IUPUI and Ball State here to speak at your, uh, what was it, Advi uh, advisors, Russ ran it, Russ and Susan ran it. I, thank you, it was transfers. I was trying to give you the right name on that. You know, they even talked about that. They know that a student who completes 
their associate with us first is a better student for them to have. So we're getting, we're working our way towards two plus two to be a true two plus two state, uh, and the TSAPs are helping as well in that. Okay, let me quickly go through goal five, which is our employee goal, and I hit that here because we know that number one, increasing retention of our high performing talented employees, we have opportunities just to make this a better place. So professional development is key. Our faculty council has agreed to take that on as the piece they will own of the strategic plan. Uh, so we'll talk about faculty council here in a minute, but also we have a team that's working on uh, other ways to help develop our employees, but also our um, evaluation process and uh, form to help make that uh, stronger as well. 5.2 is fostering creativity and innovation. I hope uh, some of you have taken advantage or will take advantage of Simplex. Do I have a few in here that have done that? Great. Um, we now have our own certified trainers within Ivy Tech. So we're gonna start offering them more for faculty and advisors. When you, if you want to sign up, uh, we're looking at, so I know your schedules, at least faculty, that Fridays are the best day. So here's three options, Friday, Friday, two weeks in a row, it's a two day class, Friday, Saturday, or trying to fit it into the breaks between semesters, like spring, fall. Um, so I just wanna get kind of a show of hands. If you'd be interested, how many would prefer a Friday, Friday option? Okay, quite a few. How about a Friday, Saturday? Okay, and how about between the breaks? Okay, well that's good. We are, it does mirror, so we've had, but that first option has been the one. Now when we go across the state, they hope that we'll consider doing some north, central, south, instead of always coming here, but uh, know that that option's going to be coming too. That's part of that creativity and innovation. Of course, we just finished Innovation Day. We had some amazing, um, my favorite was Weld Better, the fixture. Yeah. So cool. Yeah, so anyway, those we're trying to do that, but in, in every way to get involved. Um, recruiting high-performing, talented employees, just the process we've used with the provost, but also the chancellors of as we go out and um, and put ads in papers, we're not gonna just say, here's your job description. We wanna show how exciting Ivy Tech is and why this is a great place to be. So we think there's a lot of good opportunity. And of course, as we do great things, we have great people who wanna come our way. And then finally, building a world-class adjunct faculty model. Do I have any adjuncts in here? Okay, so you're doing in addition, yeah. And how many were an adjunct before in your current position? Okay, so that's where you know how important our adjuncts are to this institution. And um, we know we'd love to be able to increase pay, but it goes way beyond just increasing pay. We are looking at maybe a rank for, for those adjuncts who meet certain higher standards and are engaged a little more deeply with us in their, in how they uh, work with our students. So that's a possibility. We know there's a lot we could be doing in uh, onboarding our adjuncts. Uh, again, other places do a better job, like again, a, a Purdue Global Kaplan background. How do we help adjuncts come in, especially if they teach at multiple places? I've been adjunct at three different institutions and everyone's different, so how do we help them to really come in comfortably so they can make a, a great, have a great experience with students day one? So there's opportunities here um, and know that this is because we are one third, two thirds of two thirds fa uh, adjunct, we really, we count on our adjuncts. They, by the way, when we surveyed them a year ago with the adjunct, faculty team, 90% of adjuncts said they would do it all over again. They recognize the pay is the pay. It's not where where it um, we might ideally want it to be, but they are here, they want to be here. Um, they, they are great contributors to the work they do. We know our results of our adjuncts parallel that of faculty. So we, we appreciate them, but we can do more and we wanna continue to, to build out that model. Uh, in terms of how we're measuring our metrics on that is the Amplify survey, which is coming out again soon. So first of all, let me say thank you to the more than 80% who are, uh, 
who took it the last two times. We hope again you will please take the five to ten minutes to do that when it comes out. It is taking our temperature across the state and we can see for feedback how are we doing. We want now, I want those numbers to go up, but I only want them to go up if it's authentic. So please never tell us what we want to hear. Tell us how you're really feeling about as you answer those questions. Be honest. Um, you'll see that that's a fairly modest improvement that we're looking for. Well, when you drive a lot of change, which we are, there's a lot of things changing in our world, it's even, it's hard to stay even. So our hope is that it'll, and I would love to blow that out of the water uh, in the years ahead, but recognizing that we're going to be moving the cheese of a lot of people over just in how we do things. Eight-week class is a good example, right? Every time we do one of those, it's like, oh, it's, it's hard. So this is important, though, to make sure that we're an ever better place to work. So it helps us to listen. You will occasionally get a pulse question. Did you pulse an open-ended question? So some of the campuses did. And that's where we see one of the factors, you know, so we have multiple things it's measuring. We never see the open end. I've never seen an open end. Kathy will never see an open ended question that you answer or any of your data. It's aggregated at the third party, pulls out those key themes. And then you've probably talked with Michael. So they they spend time sharing, okay, here's what came out of it. This is what your people are saying. And it's very helpful, I think. Is that right? Okay. All right. So Please keep doing that. So strategic plans underway. Um, the goal team meetings, I just went through the monthly goal report. The teams, how many are on one of the strategy teams in here? Are there any people? Golly, okay. So we have 28 strategy teams out there. If you want to be involved in one, let us know. We'll get you on one. Um, but they meet monthly, and good things are happening with that as well. Okay, so quickly in terms of workforce alignment. You probably all know, should know this by, in your now quadrants one, two, three, and four. Quadrant one are those where we just need more students in the program. High demand, great opportunities out there, and we don't have enough students in our seats. Quadrant two is nursing, the health professions where we were limited enrollment. We fill every seat, can't meet the demand. Quadrant three are where we have too many students graduating for programs, for careers that don't need as many, so high supply, low demand. And quadrant four is where we want to be, equilibrium. Roughly the right amount of students completing for the jobs that are in our communities. So here's where you are. Quadrant one, quadrant two, quadrant three, quadrant four. What's your insight? Just as I recall, I think I think we had uh, mortuary science in the third, but then we decided that that, that because it had more of a statewide focus. Yeah, so that's why it's four. We need more students. Yeah. <laughs> Yay! So we have a lot of headroom. We got, my gosh, look at how many opportunities are out there that we're not yet filling, and they're not all. Look, there's a lot of them that are transfer, right? So like the human services, we know there's a lot of demand for social work. Um, the early childhood, computer science for transfer, a lot of demand. Pre-engineering, the engineering for that. So there's a lot of opportunity. So when you worry about whether you have job security, you do if we can get the students in. So we have to do a lot. You'll see all of our marketing is being directed towards quadrant one. So that, and that's, by the way, quadrant one here looks different than quadrant one in Columbus or quadrant one in Lake County. But you have a huge quadrant one, a lot of opportunity to have even more, make an even bigger difference uh, in the service area. Kathy, anything you'd want to add to what you all have talked about or Frank about your quadrants? <laughs> no, I think it's that we know that most of our programs have empty seats. I don't think that's a surprise. There are very few programs that you're saying, I'm sorry, I can't handle you. And I think advisors, there's very few programs where you're saying, yeah, don't do that one because you're never going to get the classes. 
um, we know that we have a, a lot of opportunity, which is really good news for us. And even our quadrant fours aren't um, overflowing. I think even those programs have space in them. It's just that they're a little more even. So I think we're in a, a good and challenging place. Well, and I think, Rick, to your comment about mortuary science, the numbers, it sounds like the numbers you saw from uh, workforce alignment probably put it in three. But you said, and this is, the, this is why the ultimate decision of where that goes is up to the campus, you said, oh, but that's a statewide program. We're doing that for the whole state, not just for central Indiana. Therefore, mortuary science belongs there. The, the thing about this structure is we feed systems office through workforce alignment will feed you data on these, uh, each of these careers, but you ultimately decide, we know the data is about 80% correct. It's not 100% correct. You then decide based on what you know, like mortuary science draws from the entire state, and you say, wait a minute, that's really we've got about the right size program there. Or your advisory, your program advisory committee says, wait a minute, it didn't pick up that our students are going to this company or that company, or we have a new emphasis just moved in to Indianapolis, 2,000 new jobs there. So there's some things that the data won't pick up on, and it's up to you to say, we will, you can override, we're giving you what the data says from DWD, from EMSI, from burning glass, which is pulling off those jobs boards. You get to then take that for your programs and say, where does it really go? So we hope that's helpful. I can tell you that employers, uh, the General Assembly, the Indiana Chamber, all those are so appreciative of us doing it. So every one of our campuses has one of these, and that's what they're working towards. So advisors, yes, do talk about those quadrant one opportunities with those 80% undecideds that you have out there. That's where we can really help. It's such a win-win when a student can say, oh, if I go into cybersecurity, I can get a job? Yeah, you could get 10 jobs. <laughs> there's, there's just, and it pays really well. So if you can have that conversation, that's great. All right, faculty council. So. Yeah, uh, Al, Al is, Rubenstein is our faculty council, he's not in here today. Um, we picked, as you know, to do the inaugural faculty council, it was the award winners from last year. Here's the list of all the members. We began meeting in October, and really this inaugural council's job is, yes, they're operating as a faculty council, but they're also setting the process for future, how do we how do we help the campuses that don't have a faculty council or senate or whatever they called it in place stand one up? And then how will we connect to the statewide? So these people um, have been meeting since October. We've had three meetings together, one of them right here. And this kind of summarizes what they're responsible for. But we'll talk about things like they're planning the Glenn Sample Award dinner, that are, those are the faculty awards this summer, so they should own that. They've picked strategy 5.1 on professional development for faculty to work on. And of course, setting up this process of how faculty council works. But they have also brought those many things that you have concerns about to the meeting. And uh, Gwen Eldridge is our faculty council chair that they elected. She had her first meeting a second meeting that she took over after she was elected. Her list was two pages long of things to talk about. We organized it and it's their meeting. We also have, like the CAOC has brought, they brought faculty loading to talk to faculty council about as they're working on the ASOM updates. And Gwen sits on the CAOC. Um, we talked about discipline dialogue days, Marcus Kolb, shared, asked for feedback, and it was lukewarm enough that the faculty council said, why don't you poll every all of faculty, and we have, and those results are coming in, and that'll decide whether we continue it or not, or what in what form it moves forward in the future. Um, the faculty pay payroll was the first meeting they had, they got hit with that, um, which was extremely helpful. But anyway, 
yeah, we talked. I mentioned that. So anyway, I, I say that to the, that the provost and I see faculty council as wise counsel to us. So I see them as if they were another member on my cabinet to give input, right? To give very wise counsel about how we go forward. And uh, so far, we have no shortage of work to do. That'll continue. But I do want you to know, feed that up to Al. And then as the meetings, we'll meet again um, during Student Success Summit. They're coming together. They have work. I think they're going to do work sessions during that time. But we, we will meet. Right now, we've met in person. We think eventually we'll be able to go to more of a distance model, a go to meeting. But they're forming, form, storm, norm, perform. They're forming well, and they want right now to continue to be together, to, to learn together and develop together. But could not we could not be happier than the commitment that we have of the people who are there. And they're very committed to figuring out how do we make sure that this structure is successful <clears throat> moving forward. Any other comments, Steve, that you'd want to give? Okay. Uh, now, this is for you. What's been your experience with the restructure? Uh, any impacts you felt, concerns you have as we went from 14 regions to 19 campuses? I know that to a great extent, you barely ever even had any changes formally, though your cabinet structure changed a little. Any feedback you have about the restructure? What would you say about it from your perspective? Yeah. yeah. They they'll they'll say it. Yeah. What has it affected you at all, Anna? I think the hardest thing is sometimes talking to it about students. You know, we're no longer a region, so with I'm a competitive health uh, and nursing advisor, so it's not in our region. Oh, but that's not how I should say it anymore. So just kind of having the students understand it has been the hardest for me. Yeah, and those that would, because we dissolved the old regions, it was our advice to let's use the term service area. It's not the end of the world. No one's going to. Unless we catch you, then it costs a dollar. But but if we don't catch you, it's okay. Now, um, now it is that notion of, and that the, the service areas are likely going to continue to evolve over time. We we did a fair amount across the state uh, of it. And, but yours, you'll have, there's always conversation, where does Green Castle go? And where does, as, as this, as this, um, the donut counties continue to shape out. And we know, for instance, Noblesville maybe could become a C3. They may at some point become their own campus because there's a lot of activity up there and a lot of potential for, for that location. So this, the new structure actually gives the ability for those as a, camp, as a location or campus grows. They can be reclassified. There is nothing above a C1. <laughs> A super C1, you're already a super C1, but <clears throat> there should be, yeah, the big kahuna. Um, so, but there are C3s out there that are so, or Warsaw, which is on the bubble of being a C3 that just, that's motivating for them as a campus to want to grow. And we want them to grow because that helps them better, to really better serve the communities they're in. So the new structure. It, it is a change, but it doesn't have the rigidity of the old regions, which is good and bad. Yes. Uh, first of all, let me say we adore Green Castle, and just in case they're on the, we we have no intention of letting them get away from us. But um, a conversation that happened yesterday, and it's been an ongoing one is we have a lot of activity up in Hamilton County, and I think most of you know that. We also have a ton of activity in Hendricks County going on. And when it comes to serving our businesses in the area, it's a real challenge for us to figure out um, how to get our two workforce consultants everywhere. Hancock County is um, a little bit of an orphan for us. 
um, in the close world. Okay, now I'm looking at Colin back there. Not in dual credit. Our schools in Hancock are served well, but there's a concern that the new businesses cropping up in Hancock County uh, might not be getting all the attention from us that they need. Oh, wait a minute. There's a service area on the other side of Hancock County at Richmond that's looking for new opportunities because Richmond is not a growing metropolis. Um, they've been losing population. So in talking with their chancellor, it's like, well, maybe we need to share Hancock County. Could your consultants come in and talk to them? The students are going to choose where they want to go regardless. So, um, so I think it, this has allowed us to have that kind of flexibility, um, which is good because we have our work cut out for us just in Marion and, you know, and Franklin's doing a great job. Uh, and it, if we have one that goes to C3 first, my, my money's on Franklin. But. So, so that might be the inside thing is which, who go to C3 first in, out of central India. But I think Kathy has described exactly what we hope would happen, which is, yes, it should always be in the community's best interest. And we want to serve all those communities. And i very appreciative that you and... Chad Bowles are having those conversations about how do we, Ivy Tech, best serve this county and the needs of these employers. And if that's here, that's great. If it's there, that's great. And we'll continue to do what's right. And over time, those, those lines are there, but we can move them as we see fit without a lot of rigidity. Anything else? I will say that... Um, the last piece, or two, two of the last pieces, one is the budget model. We said we would separate budgets, and yesterday we had uh, the chancellors come to agreement on, remember there were 14 regions, and many of those regions were by regions, so those, all those funds had been commingled. It was not a simple process to pull them apart. And then for the first time in uh, 50 years, look at it from almost a zero-based approach, what should it be? and how do we get to where they should be given growth and shrinkage across the state and the evolution. So uh, great kudos to chancellors yesterday that we have a, a consensus on that. We're still double checking the numbers to make sure that that new budget allocation model that, that was adopted is actually right. All the numbers are numerically right, so we're doing some double checking on all things, but that's a big step forward. The last piece are the hubs. So we are moving, in fact, chancellors yesterday saw the safety and security hub recommendation and adopted that. But each one of these hubs, remember the purpose is that we don't need to be doing in 19 places, 19 campuses, back office work, your front office, you're touching the student. The things that happen behind the scenes do not have to happen 19 times like payroll or financial aid processing, which of course you're already here and our, and we work with you. We're already one team here on financial aid processing, but others across the state, they're like, oh, that'd be great if one place can do it. Um, and in the midst of that, we can save labor in doing that. Those F fewer FTEs that it takes when you can organize it in one best efficient process. So that's gonna gain system-wide efficiencies, which then can be reinvested in front. So if we can save FTEs in the back office, we can then employ or invest in in the front office more in those things that services that directly help our students. The back office has to happen. It's important stuff. It's just it doesn't need to happen 19 times. We can be more efficient. So that's underway. It'll probably take another year or so to get those. We have a, a number of them underway in design, but they've not come out. And in all cases, the campuses participate and they really design the future state of what it should look like. And we anticipate that campuses will bid for those for that work. So someone, some campus, Richmond, might want to do payroll as the first thing. If they have three or four FTEs that are devoted to that on their campus. They won't all come here. Financial aid processing, because you were a leader in share, us sharing that here, it is going to be here. Columbus and Indianapolis is already working out of our, with Ben Burton's team uh, in C4. So we, we did decide statewide financial aid processing would stay within this footprint, but they won't all stay here. All right, so let me continue on. I'm gonna try to 
keep up the pace. Uh, the program chair project, and this is where I'll tag team with uh, the provost. Let me just say that that was a simplex process to really look at how do we, uh, when I got here in those first 30 days, heard the world rests on program chairs, department chairs, could you raise your hands in the room? Thank you, thank you for the good work you do because the world does rest on your shoulders at Ivy Tech. We heard it again in the restructure project about the, the challenges of being a chair. And so this project was put together. We used a voice of the customer approach on it, which was to interview 16 program chairs, three department chairs, seven deans, two CAOs, and several faculty members to get a sense of what those challenges really are. I'm gonna let um, Steve go through the recommendations. Did anyone get interviewed in here for, were you one of those by Stacy or um, Kristen Moreland? Okay. Well, I will let you, Steve, talk through the recommendations. Thank you. As President Elsman just relayed the context for the study, um, the information was reviewed and there was um, identified the frequency of items that, that occurred from those 32 interviews. And from those, there were recommendations made. And then Chris Lowry, Senior Vice President for Workforce Alignment, and myself reviewed those recommendations. and and added to or subtracted from and then presented them to President Elsperman. She reviewed those and then the, the final version uh, will be presented to the Executive Council next month. Although there's one that's already approved, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so a takeaway from the study was the amount of time that program and department chairs spend on work that is what I call tactical work. It's work that needs to be done, it's very important work but it takes your time away from student-facing activities, from working with the faculty in your program uh, program areas and, and um, instructional items. So we looked at those and uh, th that's, you'll see that's the focus of the recommendations. The one is for common professional onboarding for adjunct faculty. Again, from the review of the information, it appeared that chairs generally spend, are spending a considerable amount of time onboarding adjuncts a faculty every semester, um, you know, we hire new ones that um, I know every, every term, fall being very strong. And so looking at that, there's common items um, that would be across the college for onboarding adjunct faculty. Now this is different than the, than the human resource onboarding. This is what I call professional academic onboarding. Things like, what's an NW? <laughs> How do I process that? Um, some some intro, some basic intro into online and, and into Canvas. Some teaching, some basic teaching strategies for adjuncts. So developing a common onboarding for professional academic work uh, is what that recommendation is addressing. And then a portion of that, excuse me, a portion of that will be for the campus to customize specific things that you might want to include in there uh, from your from your own campus level. Support adjunct uh, faculty hiring process. It's the same context as the first one, but the amount of time that you sometimes spend on documenting credentials. I know when I was on campus, there was a tremendous amount of time for dual credit instructors. You know, if, if, the, if the degree is in the area, then that's a pretty quick check. But if it's not, and you're out there searching for those 18 uh, discipline hours, and you're reading course descriptions, uh, the time can go on and on. So that, that's an area where um, we would like, it might even be a hub process for that. And then also uh, checking references. This doesn't, the decision for hiring adjuncts is still at the program department or however it is in, at your campus, maybe your dean, but however that work is not taken away from that. It's again that tactical work that is involved when, uh, when a new uh, hire is taking place. Now this next one is the one that's already approved. There was, um, a re um, there was a focus uh, item that talked about a concern about those eight extra days that were added to the contract uh, several years ago now, probably when the 160, well, we reround the 160, but the eight days are, were still, are still out there. So the, the recommendation to President Elstrom was to, to and, and this actually then the CAOC um, approved a recommendation and that then that was forwarded. So they endorsed this and it's to change the eight days to a range of from four to eight. So as a chair, as a faculty member, you can decide if you want, if you want the minimum of four or, or, or I'm sorry, I didn't mean this to be so loud. So, uh, 
Um, if you, if you uh, want a minimum of four or maximum of eight or, or some number in between. I do want to remind you, when those eight days were put in, there was pay put in with that. And on your contract, it specifically identifies that pay. So if you decide to have fewer days, there would be a pay reduction associated with that. But it would be your decision. That's approved. Uh, President Esplanade approved that. And that will be effective for fall. And I, the CEOs are well aware of that. The um, other recommendations include admin support. Um, we found that that varies widely, as you might suspect, across campuses. And so providing uh, perhaps a pool of, of, of support, ad administrative support for adjuncts uh, is a recommendation for campuses to consider. I know you're very, very large, and, and I don't know what you have in place. That will be your decision, but that's a recommendation. A referral of questions to the best source. This was interesting. Again, these, were, <laughs> these had high frequency in regards to the study. And Chair said, a lot of referrals come to, come to me that I'm not the best source to answer. And there was sort, you know, and there was sort of this thought that if, if a student has a question, maybe the reply is, well, talk to your chair about that. And so they might end up in some financial aid questions or, or other areas that, that they're not the best source or maybe not even the source to address. So the recommendation is for campuses to make a matrix and ask these frequently asked questions by students, and what is the best source to address that for the student? That may seem sound simplistic, but it was a recurring theme across this study, and, it, and it, it helps in two ways. It helps the student to go to the best source right away, and then also could help the faculty um, member in regards to not addressing questions or not having referrals to them where they're not the best source to address. But I also know you are the best source in many, many areas. So uh, it, it's really a, a looking at these, those other items. The curriculum change information, this one was disappointing to me because this fall we implemented a new process for review of curriculum committee decisions. And again, Chris Lowry and myself review those. We do ask for input from the CAOs if they see something. But we, we review those and then say it's fine to proceed or if we identify an item that we'd like to some more clarification on, uh, we'll ask the curriculum committee to do that. And so the thought, and that really did speed up the review of your decisions. However, chairs weren't aware of the status of the decisions. In fact, sometimes the CEOs weren't. So learning from that, in the fall, uh, there'll be you'll, the chairs will have access to a database that will show the status of their review. Uh, and they can just go in at any time and look at it and see if it's fine to proceed to the next step. A lot of times the next step might be something that goes to CHE or it might have to go to our, uh, our trustees if it's a new program. But whatever the next step, you'll be able to hopefully uh, have, uh, uh, be readily, you'll be readily uh, able to identify the next step. And then the frame, uh, framework for course downloads. That, um, the, the recurring theme on our recurring ish item on this was there was a perception that there was inconsistency in regards to which uh, chair might receive a download and which one doesn't. So the recommendation is is for there to be a, a common set of criteria for the CAOs or the deans or however it works administratively at your campus to consider if an extra download or downloads in some case might be applicable for the chair. Items like size of the program, complexity of the program, the number of labs, uh, perhaps you're going to have an on-site uh, accreditation visit uh, because it's a campus-based accreditation, uh, the number of dual credit agreements, those types of things to be consistently applied for consideration for additional downloads. This is, I'd like to point out, this is an example of operations that President Elsterman is advocating that we that we install across the college, and it's this framework of of items to be considered and, and have some consistency in that with local campus decisions. This isn't going to say you know at 250 students, then you ought to consider a download. The numbers aren't going to be in there. It's going to be this criteria for the campuses to apply. And the last one is uh, using technology. Uh, for a number, again, of the, of the tactical work that program chairs um, do daily. And uh, uh, one is in, in regards to processing adjunct contracts. Now, that's been a dream of mine for, for years when I was on the campus. I Every time I tried to change the process, it just got more complicated. But this would be when you decide that 
this adjunct faculty member is going to be teaching this section, and so that's the input. Then from there, and then whatever other courses they might have, then a contract can be generated using technology and, the, and electronic approvals and, and all that would go. You do have electronic approvals. Well, then you. That's. All of it. Yeah. So, um, and it was value added. So, so you can. So, think about then the other 18 campuses that don't have that, and and so uh, that's a best practice. So it's, that's good, great to know. And then also using technology for course schedules. You know, we have students on 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 academic plans, and they've taken so many courses. They've been, what should they be taking next semester? And so as a program chair, you collect all that data. These are the courses that you might consider, and of course you can tweak that, but having the, the technology generate a standard uh, course schedule for you to consider. And then also book selection information. This isn't the adoption decision that you make in your curriculum committees. This is when you decide that this adoption is going to be used for a course in, uh, in your, uh, at, at your campus level. All the work that goes that being applied by section and notifying Follett, uh, once you make that decision and letting technology go forward and, um, and, and calculate and do the tactical work. So those are the recommendations. Do you have questions or comments? Okay. Well, I'll just say this. These will help program chairs, department chairs. It's still going to be a, it's still a full job. Don't worry. Um, we know that, and we'll continue to look at what progress we've made. We'll continue to look for more ways. You, it, your roles are so critical, um, and we want to support. Uh, so we'll continue to work on this, but we hope that over the next year you'll see uh, significant improvement there. Let me talk about the, the nice success we have, which is on a reverse transfer. So remember, these are our students who often transfer after the first year here, and they go off to IUPUI after that first year and they're gonna we hope they have great success and, and most of them will will succeed not all but most um, but reverse transfer says that once they hit those 60 credit hours that they if when they have met the requirements for the degree they were seeking here they should get it right and that's been my push for a little over a year now with the four-year partners that we should be doing reverse transfer so I will say to the credit three partners came on very quickly um, about a year ago, and it was USI, I, uh, ISU, and Purdue. They saw the value. They saw it, it, it. If the students earned it, they should get it. Um, if something happens in their future, then they have a degree, a credential. Uh, if they continue on, they're more likely, and the research shows, they're more likely to complete the bachelor's once they've received the associate degree through reverse transfer. So those institutions agreed right away, got on board. We have MOUs with them. CHE also last spring was asked by the General Assembly to study reverse transfer. And they did, and in November, they issued a report that leaned just as we did. It leaned with us that reverse transfer is the right thing to do. Lumina Foundation, others have said that's the right thing to do. It is a best practice. Um, and so we hoped that the other two big transfer institutions would come on board. They didn't. So um, we going into this General Assembly said, we, uh, we think that report was very strong from CHE. We crafted legislation that mirrored CHE's report. We had a senator ready to offer the bill. And the weekend before the bill was going to be offered, we got phone calls and outreach that said, we're interested in reverse transfer. Those two partners have come on board beautifully. So I want to compliment the work that IU and Ball State have both come on board with just our student in mind, understanding this is a good thing, great partnerships, and as of yesterday, I signed the, the statewide, we now have a statewide MOU with all of our four-year publics for reverse transfer. So we could do a round of applause on that one, because I mean, that's really a big deal. Um, we have hundreds now of these within that, at the 75-hour mark, the four years will send us because it, 60 is not going to be exactly the right number, right? So they'll probably be a little beyond that. So the 75-hour mark, they send us the students of ours that had residency with us. 
we get their um, transcripts. We do the crosswalking. We do the, the degree audit for them. Um, the students, we still have the FERPA piece that we're working through, um, but we're getting better at asking. And we actually have legislation offered in Congress by Congressman Luke Messer through the National Registrar's Association that said, for the purpose of reverse transfer, FERPA does not apply. That they can, that's in the prosper, it was passed out of the House. Now the bad news is the Senate doesn't like prosper the way it's written. They'll do their own version probably, so we'll have to get it in, and in the reconciliation eventually get that in. But that's a really good thing too, the recognition nationally for reverse transfer. Um, so as those come back to us, we do the, the audit. We have a retired registrar working for us to help do that. And then they call the student. This is not a degree mill. We call the student and say, did you know you're eligible for this associate degree? And we always try to do the best one. Um, if there's a, if they could, if with one more econ class they would have their associate in business, we'll say, if you would take one more class in this, you would qualify. Or if you, if you can't or won't do that, then you do qualify for the AGS. And that's something that uh, CHE has asked us to do, is not to just promote lots of AGS. There are some students where that will be the right answer, and they understand that. And we will report to CHE how many AGS are awarded through reverse transfer. But we will always encourage that career-leaning um, degree in there on their career pathway. So. Um, that's underway. The students have responded amazingly positive. So I'll share the instance of the Purdue student who when we called her, she was so excited. She said, oh my gosh, I think my brother at Ball State would qualify too. You know, so the student sees the value. It is the half marathon for them. They have achieved something. It's a credential they now own, have earned, and, and it's good all the way around. So I thank all of you for the work you're doing. Now, we're not trying to say, students, when you come in with us, we don't, we're not making a big push with our freshmen on reverse transfer, because we want them to stay two years. But when we realize that student is going to transfer for any number of reasons, some of them very good reasons because of the degree they're seeking and there's no TSAP in place, you know, we want then to tell them, hey, if you will sign this waiver so that your college that you're going to can award reverse transfer, we want to do that. So this is, this is a whole new thing, but I will tell you, I'm proud of our, the provost that came to the transfer summit, talked positively, they get it. This is the right thing for students. And um, we're very proud that this will lift for the students, they will have that credential, it will lift those Lumina numbers significantly, it will help our completions, but as important as all of those, it will help improve our data. Our iPads data will be much more accurate we will look more like a two plus two state like Florida, California, Texas, right? Where community college is in. So it will help us um, maybe not be the bottom on some of those iPads numbers. You don't ever want to have to take that interview with USA Today about being one of the worst performing community colleges on an iPads. When you know we're not, when you know the real data isn't the data is not telling the whole story. Reverse transfer will help us to uh, correct that story. Jumpstart was done right here, so we kind of share the results of Jumpstart, which was done right here in this room, actually, last summer, some of it. Uh, we had 46 students who they were traditional freshmen coming in the week to complete their IVYT, but they also did their IV prep. And each day we had a different CEO come in and talk to them. So we started with Scott uh, Davison from One America. We had one of our students come back and speak. Um, we had uh, Paul Brenner from Emmis Communications uh, speak. Um, and then I'll flip to Friday. Uh, the, well, what was cute is the first day the students hardly asked any questions. By Wednesday they were asking questions. By Friday when Doug Biles came from Motor Speedway from IMS, we had a student who asked for an internship. You know, which is great. That's exactly what we want. We want the student to, we wanted those CEOs to tell, what do we want in a graduate? What are we looking for in our employees? What are the great careers we have in our company? And then those students did a really good quiz of those professionals on tell us about your career and how you got where you were. Paul 
uh, Brenner is actually an Evansville Ivy Tecker. And he's at the pinnacle of his career. He's doing amazing things with Next Radio. Is that what it's called? Yeah, the Next Radio app. Amazing. So it was very inspirational to the students. Now, I'll say all of it looked good. We went to an, They went to an Indianapolis game the following week. They did their Ivy prep, all ready to go. And then those are the two bottom uh, things. 74% retention, fall to spring is pretty good. It's a 5 or 6% bump, that's good. That GPA does not impress me, 2.55, ooh. So we say, okay, this is a probably good thing to do. And we paid for that week, they got that free IVYT. But we wanted to see, can we move the needle with students to, to persist? Can we get a big bump? Um, so it, it went well, but I share that because these are all those kinds of things we're trying to do in student success to help students persist, and, and thanks for stepping forward here. And then uh, we talked about this, I'm going to go through that. And ASAP, I know you have a good ASAP program here. Um, I'm so impressed by it. We did, uh, and I hosted for the college, a leadership summit last year out at Delora Speedway, at the Delora facility. Uh, you can see the race car there in the background. Uh, uh, 300 people overall, but that included faculty and staff in there, but 250 ASAP students. We did a transfer fair with four-year institutions, so we had uh, 20 of those uh, attending so the students could see, meet with all the different universities across the state. Uh, but we also had uh, Sean Tierney from CHE join us to talk about something that the current students won't enjoy, but I bring it up because for us across the state, we could expand ASAP using this fast track award that CHE um, got approval from the General Assembly last year. It allows 50% of that student's financial aid, state financial aid, to be pulled forward for an accelerated program. That's a big deal. One of the challenges with us being able to do more ASAP is we have to be able to fund it at that all those credit hours. So this is one way that CHE is very supportive of what we're doing and the acceleration. Uh, we hope that maybe the federal government will get there too sometime, but for now that's a big, big step in. And I'll just ask how many ASAP students do we have here at Central Indiana? Across your, I know Greencastle has their own. You have here 125, that's awesome. I'm, I'm just going to kudos to Greencastle because I talk about them everywhere I go. What I love about what Greencastle is doing, um, and I see Logan Sport now doing that same model, is for those students who are undecided and they're good students, what a great opportunity to do ASAP. Get your two-year, right now most of them are AGS, so they wouldn't have to be, they could be a TSAP, but get your two years and every Friday you've got that day, day for development to do the career exploration activities that by the end of that year, you will know what you want to do. And you'll have a two-year degree and one-year degree and be able to go off and do that. We see, I think we see that with lots across the state, Lawrenceburg, different campuses. I visit with the students. They certainly are making that final career determination during their ASAP year. And so it's a great way to give a just a premium, exceptional experience to students so that they will be really ready to go when they leave here after ASAP. And they're marine ready, like they academically are prepared. That's what we heard um, at the summit, uh, the ASAP Experience Leadership Summit. Those who had graduated, who came back on a panel, they talked about how, in fact, one of our Greencastle graduates talked about how easy it was at IU Kelly School, you know, after you've done you know, 30 credit hours in a semester, a regular semester is just not hard. So there's a, some real advantages there, and I hope we'll continue to um, raise up and with the Fast Track Award be able to expand ASAP even further. The last for me is the Ivy Tech Honors, and I have Beth in the room with us today. Um, this has been a transition from American Honors back to Ivy Honors. Beth, thank you for your help in doing that this year. We brought on three of the 
Quad Learning Advisors to become ours. Oh, who is? All right, awesome. Welcome to Ivy Tech. Well, you were always Ivy Tech, but now you're really Ivy Tech. Well, we're committed to the honors approach. Um, we think that as we bring it in, we have even more opportunities now to make it all Ivy Tech, including that last item on there where there's a lot of excitement statewide to for campuses who didn't have the honors program before to now rethink it, but also to look at could we do an honors some honors course only options to give a premium experience to to our students that want that taste of honors, maybe not the full honors. So Beth, any update that you want to provide on Ivy Honors? Well, thank you for highlighting honors this morning. Uh, just uh, like the president said, we're excited to grow. Uh, we're just kind of in a soft transition phase to, to move the American Honors folks over. Uh, we're graduating a record number of students this semester. I think we're over 50. So that's, that's exciting. Um, but we hope to add a couple more campuses uh, this time next fall and then move uh, even more broadly and have the courses only option. So thank you. And it's exciting to transition and grow. And, and uh, there you go. Thank you. Well, thank you, Beth. And uh, it's Sh Shahana, welcome. It, well, you know, you all were great parts of us. And we're so glad to have gotten to bring you on, and we want this to be seamless to the students who've been involved, but we do want to grow it, so I'm so excited. I hadn't heard which two camp, there's two of them so far that are looking seriously. Shooting for two, good. Well, and that's one of the reasons we've um, brought, put this on here, so we can let campuses know that this really is a time to rethink and, and provide that opportunity. I think ASAP and Ivy Honors, those are the kinds of, uh, enhanced experiences that we can offer uh, and really help our students see see more opportunities here at Ivy Tech. Okay, so that's the end of mine. I'm turning it over. See, I, I dominate. I take way more than I should at the time, but I'll let you provost. It's all yours. Thank you. And we'll fast forward here. We, we really do want to leave some time at the end for open dialogue, so a couple of items. Uh, that I do want to highlight, though, and, and one is, as President Elshman talked about, the, the regional, the campus restructure. Concurrently, there was a uh, system-wide academic restructure occurring. We've already talked about the faculty council and then also the curriculum committees, which have been in place for, for, for many, many years. Uh, but part of that, the, the review of the decisions of the curriculum committees was part of the restructure that I mentioned earlier and that occurred in the fall. And that's uh, recognizing HLC's expectation that faculty own the curriculum. I might would say when we do review your decisions, it's based upon is it within academic policy? Does it link with the strategic plan? Does it link with some CHE expectations, external uh, agency, external stakeholders' expectations, and then link with our mission and our vision? Then also uh, the, the Campus Academic Officer Committee was restructured from the REOC, which was regional. But the CAOC is not just the REOC with 19 members. Of course, Frank is, is a respected member of that committee. But in that change in, in the review of the, of the decisions of the curriculum committee, it allowed more time for the CAOC to be to look at our academic initiatives, our academic issues, our academic opportunities from a more strategic perspective. And the CAOC is reviewing all of the academic policies. We know that they need, there needed to be some updates because we needed to change regions to campus, but much more needed to be done than just that, that vernacular change. So they have a lot of work that they're doing in regards to the academic policy. They own the academic policy. And then there's uh, many, many other opportunities that fill your time. Frank, is there anything you want to add on that restructure? I think it, it uh, expanded. We went from uh, 14, if you will, or 11 to 19. And uh, I think Steve and, and Russ in particular did a good job of trying to bring those people in, mentor them. And it also created a little bit more of uh, energy, if you will, into an ideals that maybe most of us have been sitting on it for a while. You sort of get into a, a pattern. So I think that did it. We are, as Steve said, we're doing the ASOM, but not, we are sort of looking at the parts. Some of them don't belong to us. Some of them belong to the student affairs part of it. So 
we're just looking at that. But you find we find stuff for four, five, six years ago that are old uh, in that process. So the CAOC sort of turned out to be sort of a working staff group on a lot of different things. I think that, that helped. Thanks, Frank. I do want to mention in regards to the faculty council, I say the precursor for that was the was the uh, faculty task force one and two. Jamie Hamilton is your representative from, from, from the Indianapolis campus. And that's the council that really worked with us in regards to um, reversing out and the recommendations on the student engagement hours, but also defining what student engagement was. We, we heard, I heard early on that we really need to have a research-based definition of student engagement. They have done a, a lot of work in regards to the, the, the uh, matrix for the faculty evaluations. Uh, at that time, it was region, so every region has a representative. So I wanted to acknowledge their work and thank Jamie for representing your, your campus. The, um, hopefully you're aware that we are in HLC accreditation affirmation. We've changed our word on that from reaccreditation. Actually, um, Chancellor McCurdy at uh, Kokomo from the institution, he came out, they must have had a recent, um, went through HLC uh, review recently because that was uh, a term that he used and I liked it, so I, I changed it twice. So the, 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 the site visit will be, the site, there we go. The site visit will be uh, April of next year, April 2019, uh, mid, the, the mid part of the month. Uh, and so prepping up for that, uh, and again, this was from a discussion with the COC uh, earlier uh, this month or, or last month, that um, there's a little bit of angst across the college in regards to preparation. So there'll be two mock visits yet this spring at two campuses. And I think it's Indianapolis. It is Indianapolis and Columbus. And then in the spring and in the fall, every campus will have a mock visit in regards to prep, uh, preparing for the, for the reaccreditation. While we expect to only visit uh, four or five campuses, it's obvious they're going to be here at Indianapolis. They may decide to visit every campus. That's what they did 10 years ago. Um, and if I said, if I was on the team, I came, here's the four or five campuses. Oh, I'd like to go to this one that wasn't maybe prepping more, more uh, in detail. So uh, Frank shared that, that you have some work going on. Carol, I think, uh, where is Carol? Yeah, hi, I'm sorry. Didn't, uh, Carol is the representative uh, on the state, on Marcus' team that he convened. Uh, Carol, do you have any uh, perspectives that you'd like to share? I know you met last week or so, and, and you're starting to really ramp up work on that. But any, any additional comments? Thank you. Just that Marcus has divided the criteria among the members of the representative team. Uh, there are three of us on criterion three and our task is to start collecting examples. So the folks who are on uh, Dr. Lee's executive council are now going to hear from me every meeting um, until as Jerry Harrell said, I throw up my hands and say that's enough. Um, I will over the next year be meeting with different members of the executive council and their teams to kind of ferret out what are some really good examples we can use to show that we're doing what we say we do. Thank you. And as one of our, our state trustees um, uh, remarked when Marcus gave a, presenta a presentation demo on, on HLC at the last uh, last trustee meeting, he said, this is a, you know, we want to view this as an opportunity to make us as a stronger institution. I mean, we obviously need to, that's a given, that's the bottom line. But beyond that, it's an opportunity from the, when peers come in and evaluate us, and they look at our argument statements, and they're going to validate were we accurate in those argument statements. So we're going to, we got great stories to tell in several areas, and we've also had the opportunity to talk about areas for improvement. So as we go through it, I think it, it is the opportunity to make us stronger. From their visit 10 years ago, there were several areas that they identified uh, that they would like for us to address. Now, we got full accreditation 10 years ago, but there's always areas to look at. But remember, 10 years ago, we were, we were moving into a comprehensive community college by the state, from the state legislation. And the question was, can we really pull this off? We had gone through the Vincennes um, agreement, and at this point, we were really standalone. So that was only 10 years ago. Think about the story that you have to tell 
for our faculty. Uh, I, I happened to be on the stack committee when we did the course to course transfer, and so we came away with 72 courses. And our faculty worked with university faculty, and there's a 30 credit hour gen ed across the state. And now our faculty work with university faculty, and we have the TSAPs that transfer to every public university. So the question was, are you going to be able to pull this off? I think you have a real strong story to tell in, in regards to that, that uh, item that was on the report. Uh, also, the diversity of faculty and staff will be reporting out on, on activities and initiatives in that area. And then the measurement of student learning. You know, that's the topic. That's a hot topic with HLC, assessment of student learning. As I review across <laughs> curriculum committee decisions, uh, there's a lot of data that you look at. There's a, there is a lot of assessment of student learning, from the program objectives to, to linking up all the course objectives, mapping them into the, the program objectives, capstone course results, the gen ed, uh, the overall gen ed outcomes that's being reviewed. The question is, what do we do with it? So we have a lot of information there, but what do we do with that assessment in regards to the curriculum, and it's your decision as faculty, but what, what do we do with that in regards to new teaching strategies or changing the curriculum or changing prereqs or however that might impact? Certainly, certainly not up for me to say. You're the content experts, but I would encourage you, particularly as you go through the fall, to document decisions that you make that's data driven from assessment. That's the one area that I, I think we can continue to, to shore up. And then uh, the, uh, the faculty in the institution that was identified, and uh, President Elsterman, you know, quickly embraced the opportunity and, and implemented the faculty council. That's that's part of that uh, uh, story to tell in regards to that area. And then uh, I've already talked about the mock campus visits. So, Carol, thanks for your work and what you shared. Are there any questions, though, or observations you have as we are? Uh, ramping up, if you will, the re, re I'll say reaccreditation, re affirmation process. Okay. And what? This might have gone out. There's a couple of other uh, items. One is professional development. You'll see that throughout the strategic plan and a number of, um, of areas in regards to emphasis on adjunct faculty, but we've already addressed that, but I wanted to make sure that you were, I just wanted to highlight that as an area of focus. The campus structure, uh, that's the, the student's academic experience at the campus. Um, that, that's, when, there's no issue here. That was the expectation that every campus would have a full-time faculty member in the discipline if they offered an associate degree. So you could, but it is an issue at some of our smaller or it is an item to address at some of our smaller campuses. But I, I, I'm going to be real quick on this, but I just feel I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about an experience I had on this campus yesterday in regards to the student experience. So I, I talked to Carol about general studies students a, a few days ago, then talked to Sherry. Sherry set up that I could visit one of your, a capstone course of general studies students. It was their last class. It was an eight-week class. It happened to be yesterday. It was at 11 o'clock, and all their work was done. So first I'm thinking, okay, many are going to leave because they know they can. Well, there were 20 students, 20 students stayed. In fact, they stayed past the 30 minutes that, that was allowed. And I, I'm not going to do a good job of relaying to you, and they use this word, how they love Ivy Tech, and how um, their experience here has been instrumental for them. Now, this is their capstone course in general studies. We're looking at general studies. How can we make that uh, a more, uh, well, perhaps, how can we improve that degree for student options? And there was some good feedback in regards to that. But they, and they verified what we said. They said, you know, at our high school, the counselors, all we talk about are the big universities. But at Ivy Tech, the quality of education, and they said it, and I'm just almost a direct quote, better because we don't have large lecture courses. And they talked about, uh, you know, Sherry is such an advocate for, for those students. And uh, having them have career 
uh, expectation of what are they going to do with that degree. So I did want to uh, work this in real quick just to let you know of how positive those students were and it's a reflection of all your good work from the advising up front to all the, the faculty that they've had. They, they had some good suggestions that I'm, I'm bringing forward uh, uh, that, that might help uh, link that one was to have an internship course actually for general studies students. So, and then also one that area of in, uh, emphasis is on certificates. Have they thought about taking or uh, ha earning a certificate within the open framework of that of that degree? So those are areas that we'll be hardly focusing on. Um, and I think Dr. Elsman mentioned the NLN uh, Commission uh, exit interview, one of the best exit interviews I've, I've attended here. And then the last item I want to talk about is the School of Arts and Sciences Education Strategic Development Council meeting. This is a, a council that Dr. Baker convenes. It's, it's, there's university representatives at the council. And I just happen to be attending this meeting. And one university representative said, we here Ivy Tech is advising students in away from transfer and into workforce focused areas. So I'm so glad I was there and I'd be able to, to give a perspective on that. So work for, as we you know, workforce alignment is expected from us from the legislation. But it always has been. We've been workforce, but it was really re-emphasized a couple of years ago. But transfer, when we became comprehensive community college, transfer is also part of our legislative mission. But as Dr. Elsterman said, it's still a workforce. If you're transferring and you're going to earn a bachelor's degree or a graduate degree, it's still, there's work, is there a workforce demand at the end of whatever that, that uh, educational pathway is? So I was able to share that workforce is the impetus in regards to our transfer program. It was very evident in psychology when we, uh, 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 President Elsman asked us to say, what's the demand for that? And we looked at that, it's really at the graduate level. But there was more demand than there was supply. But it's also in our pathway of certificates that stack to either a TC and or an almost all into an AAS degree that has that workforce focus. So the one focus is on transfer, but in the secondary, and I don't mean that in like a monetary way, but after that transfer, then workforce. Or it's workforce in regards to certificates and AAS, but can still transfer, but doesn't have near the, 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 the array of possibilities of transfer, but it still is an opportunity to transfer in AAS. I know there's discussion amongst faculty in regards to, well, all we hear is workforce. You know, are we abandoning our, our uh, transfer mission? I'd really like to open it up to see what your thoughts and, and perspectives might be on that topic. I, I just tried to provide a little context that came from that conversation, but what are your thoughts on this? And I think I shared it out. And it was sort of this perception that we're all workforce. So I appreciate just the, 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 the verbiage around transfer and, you know, if it's 60, 40, whatever. I mean, if there's no hard, hard line there. But um, I appreciate us really making sure that we continue to say that. And I like your thoughts about uh, certificates in general studies. I think that could be good. So, yeah. I would just add that if we need to be... 40% uh, sub-baccalaureate and 60% going on to transfer to bachelor's and, and graduate degrees, we would do that. That's, that would be appropriate. It's what the workforce demand is that says what is that 60-40, 50-50, 40-60. It's really going, that's going to evolve, but I think the point that Steve's making is such a good one. We want to ensure every one of our students has a career when they leave here and get to the end of that educational pathway, however many steps that has. This is a discipline that our four years have not yet um, put in place. We are leading the way with the quadrant work that as we talk about it, it should be, and that is not a dirty word. Workforce is, as parents, I know we all get it, right? 
We want our kids to have a career when they complete whatever their post-secondary is. It's just that some people have a longer post-secondary path than others. And the beauty, which I don't think you said this time, but we talk about often, is that we have stackable credentials. So they may start with that welding PC, et cetera, out there, and then they may go for the industrial maintenance, and then they may go for a bachelor's uh, in business. We can make that, and they might get their MBA after that. We, we have a much better view. We get to see every level of that, and we're putting that discipline in the state to what does that look like. I will be surprised, this is my prediction, that not too far in the distant future, CHE and others will start expecting the kind of quadrant work we do here with our state institutions so that they can say, if they go to them with what is the demand, and are we meeting the needs of Indiana? It's the, the, the beauty of us is we are community focused, so we can actually look in our own backyards and say, what do we need? What will it take? And our students primarily plan to stay in this area. So we're very much aligned. But I think we're really leading the way uh, in creating that alignment in a good way, never limiting our students, but always giving them ever stronger career pathways that serve them, but also serve our communities. And, and as the last CHE Academic Affairs and Quality Committee, which is the subcommittee of the commission that reviews all uh, degrees before they're, they're presented on, there was a proposal from, a, uh, from an extension university for a doctorate in philosophy. And the question was asked, well, what is the demand and what's your projections in it of graduates and what's the demand? And it was put on hold for them to come back and talk a little bit more about in regards to that question. So two real quick items, and this is data. And I'll send, we'll send this uh, PowerPoint to Frank. There's other data in here from the National uh, Community College Benchmarking Study that will affirm what you know about student demographics, but it is a data for that. And you might find that interesting. But I want to look at the graph here for the 150% for the graduation rate, first time, full time. We hovered eight or nine. It was like, you know, just a, a very quiet ocean and then in, in regards to that. But then all of a sudden, a wave started to come in. In 2011, at 8%, and 2014, at 16%. I hope you're encouraged by that because, you know, there, and that's interesting, like 2% every year. So now it's doubled. Yes, we have a long way to go to become to the median. But your good work in regards to student initiative, student advising, uh, perhaps I mean, we could start listing them all, and there's a whole host of, of um, variables in there that contribute to that. We can't identify if there's one that stands out. But your, your persistence in regards to helping students be successful, and, and when we look at this macro data, I hope you find that encouraging. And you'll see something very similar, we won't go there, in regards to the on time, in fact, it's more than doubled when you look at the on time, on time graph that will be in the, in the PowerPoint. So at this point, let's open it up for anything that we've already talked about you want to elaborate on or anything that we haven't that you want to bring up, the President uh, and, and myself. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, they've, most everyone's been sitting through the new advising training this week, and they keep hearing um, that we would be tracked to see how much time we are spending with students. This sounds like the engagement hours that I thought were not required at this point. Um, as far as documenting, is there a specific number of hours, and has that changed? I'm, I'm, I'm really not aware of that. We, we'll, we can take that back and follow up. I just don't have any insight on it. I'll just so link back to what we talked about earlier, which is we know with 17% of the students being still on their expected time frame, we probably need to touch that student more often. I don't think it's time, it's touches. How many times are we connecting with and making sure that our student is on track and has a clear vision of where they're going and has a, a degree plan in place and things of that, that academic plan in place. So 
Yeah, we. this is a new term. That's not a term we've talked about in any formal way. Right, right. Any other questions, Jess? Um, I teach the general studies capstone class. You were in my class yesterday. Hi. Yeah, that's okay. Okay, so I t I've been teaching that class now for years, and the number one thing I hear from students when we go through, um, I'm trying to get them prepared to transfer, is that they don't, they were never introduced to the information about what Ivy Tech offers. They were never made aware of all the programs. They weren't even made aware of the certificates. And so they're coming with a blank slate just saying, I don't know what I want to do. So they're navigating these waters. And then by the time they get to me, you're about to graduate and I'm introducing all this information. And it seems like I'm a day late and a dollar short. And so I've, I've brought it up before in other meetings. Is there any way that we can maybe, I hate, I know that, you know, we don't like to use the word mandatory, but is there any way that we can like mandate um, something that would introduce them to as much information as possible when they first get here and say, I want to be general studies? Because many of them I'm finding either come back for a second degree, there's a lot of students that come back for a second degree or, or a certificate, because, but it took you a whole degree to figure out what you want to do. And that really shouldn't be the case. You are exactly right. So that's where that career development opportunity, if we know their general studies, we have them at least go through some sort of career development time. Uh, yeah, Kathy, add to this. Yeah, um, actually, I'm going to put a plug in um, for you, Sue. Um, we, our leadership team here yesterday, sat through an EMSI sales pitch. But um, so the folks that gets, get us all the data that is on the website, you know, a jobs and it pays this much and here are the openings. Um, they do a lot more than just that. They pull amazing data. But they have a new career development app. And it would be on everybody's phone and you would simply say, okay, you can do the six question test that sends you off in a direction. I'm looking at Frank because he was there too. Or the 60 question app and they said, we'll tell you which one the students do. They do the six questions. But it takes you down the path, and then it ties into all the data about if this is the type of skill set you have, these are the um, careers that we offer at Ivy Tech, this is what the curriculum looks like, here's the program, you know, you can build it out from there. But we know that our students live on apps, they don't live anywhere else. And I was like, oh, we really got to look at that, please. <laughs> I can't wait to see it, so I'm sure yeah, oh good, good. So that's, so, and I hate it because you feel like you were a day late and a dollar short. You've, you've done the best you can, but our students, yeah, for those almost 80% of non-nursing students, right, that, that uh, there's a lot of opportunity for us to do, to do some things better. And uh, I, first of all, I'm embarrassed. So I, I didn't just recognize you sitting there. It was a great opportunity. But, but I did ask, and so one of the takeaways from these interventions is what might we be able to do to help particularly general studies students to be more aware. One was, what if we had a letter from the president, and then we had a, a brochure of all these 70 some certificates, because as advisors, I think, wow, how would, if you know this array of certificates, if I'm a computing program, I probably know some certificates in that, but they could, they're, it's vast in regards to their opportunities. And I asked them if they received a like a formal what legal size letter with Ivy Tech logo on it, and it said Office of the President or President Else or whatever it said, would you open it? And uh, I think everyone said that they would because one of our how do we communicate with students? And so that's one of the projects that we'll be working on. And another idea that they had, they said, well, we it's out there on my, on on my Ivy. It's out it's it's out there. Didn't you? And they said if it was just kind of, if, if they received something early on in categories, uh, books, you know, put, and the information in that, and if it was, a, then they could at least know that one source to go to and, and click on this tab instead of uh, sort of a hodgepodge of information. Come, I thought that was a good takeaway too. Yes. Hi, I don't really have a question, just a clarification on a previous question. Um, 
myself and Amy Griffin, our director of advisor, and some of the other lead advisors have been leading the new model, new academic advising model training. And what was expressed in that was that um, something that was part of the new academic advising model wasn't necessarily a specific number of hours that you had to spend, but that you had to use the Starfish or Ivy advising tool for keeping notes with interactions that you had with students and book in tracking appointments that you had with students. And several people asked me throughout the trainings that we've done so far, um, how many hours are we supposed to do this? What does this mean? And I said, we're not here to tell you anything about how many hours you're supposed to do. We're just showing you how to book appointments, how to build appointments, and how to track notes. So just as a point of clarification, there was not any sort of mandate as to how much time people were supposed to be spent doing that. Other items? Okay. If, if not, Sue? I'm just going to close for us to say thank you. Thank you for everything you do. Um, it's been, I'm on about month 20 now. And I can tell you, you know, when you come, you kind of wondered when I, when I open the hood, what will be under that hood, right? I can just tell you that you all have, have over delivered on everything I hoped would be under that hood. Um, I've never met, and I, I'm very proud of the institution I came from at University of Southern Indiana. I thought our faculty and staff there were great. Our faculty and staff here are amazing. You all do exceptional work every day, and you expect your, you have such high expectations, and you're willing to bend about any different way to help our students, and I just want to say thank you for that. Now, as I say thank you for that, we have a lot more to do. We still have to figure out how to bend in some other different ways to meet even more challenges of our students as we continue to help them succeed. So in advance, I say thank you. Thank you for being such great team members. Thank you for always putting our students first and for really helping us meet our mission in Indiana. And Steve, it's been such a great pleasure to be on this journey with you. So. Let's end with one more thank you for Steve.